today you'll be hearing from Dr. Daryl Smith, who's a professor, professor of education and psychology at Claremont Graduate University. Uh, we had the honor to have Dr. Smith with her early in, earlier in the day with us um, for a, a different audience, a different talk. Um, so she's already well into her day right now. Uh, but if this talk is going to be anything at all like what we experienced this morning, you are in for a treat. Uh, we all enjoyed what she had to say very much, found it extremely helpful um, and extremely empowering to know that uh, what the, th the, the directions that we're thinking of, what we've been thinking of here, um, fit with what she's finding in, in a national sense and that we can glean from that and draw from that to uh, propel ourselves even farther here. Um, Penn State is barred very heavily from the research of Dr. Smith um, as we put together our framework to foster diversity. Um, if you're familiar with that document, the four <coughs> dimensions of diversity under which we've arranged our several, seven challenges, those dimensions come from Dr. Smith's work. And if you've read it closely enough to read the footnotes, you'll see her name quite a few times in there. Um, so it's with great appreciation that we welcome her here today. Dr. Smith earned her bachelor's degree in mathematics from Cornell University, a master's degree in student personnel and counseling from Stanford University, and a PhD <coughs> in psychology and higher education from the Claremont Graduate School. Prior to assuming her current position on the Claremont faculty in 1986, Dr. Smith served as a college administrator for two decades in planning, institutional research, and student affairs. Her research, publication and teaching focus primarily on diversity in higher education, including organizational implications of diversity, developing capacity to evaluate diversity initiatives, and faculty diversity. Her topic for us today is the imperative of diversity for institutional viability, building capacity for pluralistic society. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Daryl Smith. I think we understand. 
the heart and soul of work that began 40 years ago in higher education about equity issues and historic issues with respect to uh, historic, historically underrepresented minorities, as we call them. And that work has now become more urgent, in part because of changing demographics of our society, and I'll show you that in a minute. But that work is still unfinished. We've made some progress in some domains, no question. But if you look at the data and the significance of the data about health gaps, educational gaps, quality of life, um, urban issues, I mean, you just name them. Our issues are getting more demanding, and they've been around for 40 years. And at the same time, we've got increasing domains for diversity, which are not trivial and are terribly important as well. I've got up here the role of religion. After 9-11, and this talk is really about institutional capacity, so it's going to require you to shift how we can really think about this. After 9-11, most of our institutions were caught pretty under, unprepared to deal with questions of Islam. A lot of ignorance, a lot of, what are we even talking about here, a lot of stereotype. That not only had implications for Muslim students on our campus and faculty and staff, but it just had, at its core, our capacity to even talk about what was going on in the world was severely constrained because we had no expertise to speak of in many of our campuses about Islam. So the role of religion, let alone our domestic issues of religion, has become increasingly important as it intersects traditional issues of diversity. Diversity has profound implications for political structures and access to power. And here again, you can see an international implication of this as well as a domestic implication. Who has access to power around the world has a lot to do with political stability around the world. There are numbers of political scientists have looked at stability of society as a function of economic gaps in society. And you can do a map of the world and show unstable regions of the world and economic gaps in the world. Well, that doesn't speak to the issue of diversity, not only internationally, but domestically, when we know that economic gaps in our society have increased. These are pretty powerful domains for diversity today. The whole issue of human rights and equity. Again, you can look around the world, but you can look here. Who's in our prison? Who's not in our prison? Who gets arrested for certain kinds of drug use? Who doesn't? These are equity issues at home as well as around the world. The histories of violence and injustice, we have no capacity, although I think we're getting better at it after the inauguration, I'm feeling a little more hopeful, to deal with our historic issues. If you look at uh, South Africa, for example, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Mandela's role, part of that, the power of that, the inspiration of what South Africa taught us was that we need to name the histories of injustice in order to move forward. What has been our pattern in this country has been, that was then, this is now, forget about it. So if we want to talk about tribal issues in this country, civil rights issues of all kinds in this country, you know, we don't want to talk about slavery. That was then, has nothing to do with now. Well, what we know is history lives in the present. Uh, I've become a great admirer of the study of history as a result of the diversity work I do. So that our capacity, both as institutions <coughs> and as a nation, to deal with histories of violence and injustice is one of, going to be one of the ways in which we can help ourselves move forward. And South Africa is a wonderful model of this. But our model has been, as I said, historically, that's just being negative. And I'll give you the example of the inauguration because I, I just watched this. In our country, the, the stories about civil rights and the history of civil rights have been parallel narratives. Communities of color have the narrative, and they tell the story whatever they can, and Black History Month is a good time to do it. Right? And then the dominant discourse is about democracy and how great we are and all the things we are. For the very first time in my lived experience, I watched an inauguration in which the intersection of the historic story of who built the White House and the, the celebration of American democracy were one narrative. These were not either ors. And I wondered why we could do that so effortlessly. The Republicans were doing it. I mean, everybody was telling this story. This was now a claim of success for the United States of America, not only for us, but around the world. We had done something. And our narratives intersected at that moment in a way that I'd never heard them intersect. And I thought, well, it might be because this was a moment of success. And so we were freer to talk about the past. And one of the challenges for our institutions as we do this is, and part of the reason I talked this morning about monitoring progress, 
is so we can name our successes as well as the issues to be addressed. Because one of the questions that came out immediately after Obama's election, well, race is done, we're done, we've done it. And it's clear from all these things I've said that we haven't done it. So we have a success and we have work to do. So dealing with histories, I think, is a very important question. How do we do that? Brown University, when uh, Ruth Simmons came, said, let's deal with slavery at Brown University. Let's name it and talk about it and say, what is our implication? I don't know what your history is, but I bet you have an interesting one here. The health and well-being of societies. We, I've already said, the health and well-being of society, political stability, economic viability, the future of the society, is going to rest on our ability to deal with diversity. And we certainly, with our changing demographics now, we'll see that, and I'll say a minute about that. The equity issues around the world and in our societies continue to grow in terms of groups that are going to address issues of equity, whether it's uh, uh, gay, lesbian issues of equity, transgender issues of equity, race, ethnicity, emerging groups that were historically not here, do here, are coming. Immigration has changed the face. This is, this is, we're on our next wave of immigration in this country. That's going to play out in some very interesting ways with respect to diversity. We need to be able to deal with that institutionally, academically, and educationally. Multiple and intersecting identities. The reality is that multiplicity of identity. Identities become salient because of a social and historical context for identity. But we have multiple identities, and we've had a hard time engaging this notion of multiplicity of identity and the intersections of identity. So if you look at most higher education reports on progress, you have the race report and the gender report. Yeah? But what we know in education at all levels is there's a race and gender thing going on there, whether it's African-American men, whether it's uh, white women in science. So the notion of being able to handle intersections is going to become very, very important. Uh, I said this morning, uh, one of my favorite ethnic studies, both in the early days of black studies, was uh, all the men, let me see if I can get this, I'm tired. Uh, all the men are black, all the men are black, all the, no, all the blacks are men, all the women are white, and some of us are brave. And it was the, the story of black, black women's studies. So intersections. We have to begin to look at our data to see what is the story being told when we look at the intersection of race and gender. Indigenous communities. One of the commitments I made to myself as a result of the work we did with the Irvine Project uh, some years ago was that one of the groups that gets lost in our historically underrepresented minority discussions is Native people indigenous folks. And in different parts of the country, this is a very salient issue. But the numbers get to be so small that we sort of forget about them. So paying attention to the future, the sovereignty, the visibility, and the viability of Native communities is becoming an issue not only for the US, but also around the world. So if you go to South Africa, uh, you go to uh, Canada, you go to uh, Australia, New Zealand, China, dealing with the history of indigenous people in those contexts is very, very important. Science and technology. For those of you who are scientists in the room, we sometimes talk about diversity in curriculum, meaning history, and studies, and literature. I've made a commitment that we're going to talk about STEM fields as well, and a data point. I'm just working now with the survey of our doctorates. Who gets PhDs in this country? A data point most people don't know. 87% of the Asians getting their PhD, any degree, with a PhD in this country in the last number of years. This, in 2006, 87% were non-citizens. That means that Asian Americans get fewer PhDs than African Americans. But it also means, and I'm going to go further, I haven't finished this work yet in, the, in my field, what this means is our capacity as a country, it's not to make a dichotomy between international and stuff, but nevertheless, we have to ask ourselves, are we doing the work to produce the domestic capacity to participate in the STEM fields. This is hugely urgent. And it, you'll see it with faculty hiring in other ways. We're relying on an international community to serve that purpose. But if these are non-citizens and we have visa problems coming, staying here, we do not have the capacity. There was a recent report in California that said that the state of California is going to have to import a huge chunk of its labor from other states because it does not have the capacity because of its educational system to have the workforce that it needs for the technology of California. So this is happening all around the country. And demographic shifts, of course. We are a country that is fastly changing demographically. So what once 40 years ago might have been, we're only attending to thinking about 10% of the population, 
I live in a state, majority minority. It's the way I think the world is. And when I come to this part of the world, I think, oh, I'm in a different part of the world. Remember, I was going to Ohio talk, and somebody said, Smith, remember, you're not in California, so make sure your examples fit Ohio. <laughs> so I went to the Wichi website, which is one of my favorite places to look, and I got this, I got yours for Pennsylvania, but I did theirs for Ohio, and I'm like, oh, this is a different kind of world. So <laughs> this, this is, um, the Western Institute State Commission does a state-by-state, -state, um, this was supposed to be a projection of public high school graduates by state. So green is white. Now, if you look at California, it doesn't look like this at all. But the important point here, and this inner circle is 2014, so we're not talking projections into the year 2090, are we? The bottom line here, this is African American, this is Latino, this is Asian, and Native, less than 1%. But the bottom line here is 75%. 25% of the population of Pennsylvania is not white. And the other bottom line here is that the white population in Pennsylvania is declining. So what's happening in Ohio is they're coming to California for institutions that care about enrollment. They're coming to California to recruit. So for me, the question is, how, do, how attractive are you, really, for somebody from Los Angeles to come to Ohio? So attractiveness and capacity and knowledge is very important here. So when I looked at these data, and I then got some data from Penn State, and I'm not sure they're totally accurate, but it looked to me like for underrepresented minorities, you're at about 9% undergraduate. And if you take Asian Americans in that mix, you're at about 14%. So if the state is 25% non-white, and you're at 14% non-white, now if you get international students, oh dear, um, uh, graduate students, I mean, scary. 24% international. Again, nothing wrong with international, but we need to pay attention then what's happening in terms of our capacity to build knowledge in a domestic uh, population. So, now, what's happening with diversity on our campuses? <coughs> the rhetoric about diversity is increasing. Yeah? We're getting more and more concerned about this. The list of diversity identities grows. So, this notion about what do we mean by diversity, that dreaded question, the definition. And every time that question comes up in any group I participate in, anxiety. Because the issue becomes the way we've traditionally done it. It's sort of a zero-sum game. If diversity is about race, then everybody else doesn't count. If it's about everybody, then our historic issues will go away. And that's how that framework got developed that you're using. So we need to talk about that. <coughs> Programs and projects are growing, often on the backs of the same people who've been doing this work for a lot of years. So burnout, I've seen more and more people saying, if, if the institution isn't seriously committed to this, I'm out of here. No more diversity task forces for me, because the, the reports could have been written 40 years ago. One of my favorite exercises is to read diversity task force reports on a campus when I come and see whether it could have been written 40 years ago. And I hate to tell you, it could have been. So the human capacity is not necessarily growing. <coughs> Even in many cases, I'm not sure if it's true of you, but in many cases, certainly in California, the undergraduate student diversity is growing in leaps and bounds. So what we've got is this situation that's going to look a little like South Africa was looking. That is, the students are students of color and everybody else is white. So we need to be careful. And the only leadership for this work on many campuses is coming from people whose designated job is about diversity. So again, it's coming, it's not at the core of what the institution does. And as I said, the conversations and committee reports could be 40 to 50 years old. There's competing views of where progress is made. And that's what I talked about this morning. I mean, what you'll have is, because diversity is about so many things, leadership marks progress. That's what leaders have to do. So a leader gets up and says, we're making progress on. <coughs> Meanwhile, if I'm a part of the activist community on a campus and I'm looking and saying, but that's not doing, that's not, that's not, what we get is competing rhetoric here. And part of the goal of the framework with monitoring progress is we're able then to deal with multiplicity and say, we're making progress here, we're not making progress over here. And we can have both those things stated at the same time. The other thing that's pretty common, and again, you're ahead of the curve here, is that diversity efforts are largely parallel to core functions. The mission statement, strategic plans, accreditation, unit plans, program reviews. The diversity efforts often get mobilized after a crisis. So I was on a campus in the South recently, and 
this campus was not engaging diversity systemically and strategically at the core. And I said to the president of that campus, all you need is a news incident here. And you're going to have people sitting in and making the same demands that were made 40 years ago. I arrived on that campus, and they had discovered a news in the basement of a residence hall that very day. And as you can imagine, the campus was appropriately activated by that. But the challenge is, if we don't get ahead of that and think about this strategically as an ongoing thing, what we're going to have is episodic responses to diversity. And where we tend to be episodic is about incidences. I also observe that in many campuses, and I don't think it's happening here because of the strategy you're using, that many task forces are struggling with a plethora of programs and activities and events. In other words, every issue comes, we've got a program to solve it. But our capacity to do programs, our people to do programs, and these days with budgets, our resources to do programs are quite limited. So what we've got is Project Itis instead of any strategic, synergistic approach to diversity. And now internationalization initiatives. And I gather you've got some of those here. Again, we can talk about, I'm not being anti-international. You saw my presentation about the domain. This is a global phenomenon. But the challenge now is, and I've been on too many campuses where this has happened. I'm mindful of the people who do diversity work, and whether they're feeling supported, excited, positive, hopeful for the future, or burned out, angry, cynical, about any possibility for change. And here's what happens. In fact, I was on a campus recently where this happened. The provost came up and said, you'll be so excited to know that we've just launched a globalization initiative. And I'm very supportive of that. But I listened. Launched a globalization initiative. It had fanfare. It had money. It had publicity. It had visibility. It had senior <laughs> level support. And I said to this provost, do you want every diversity person on this campus who's working on diversity to be pissed? And he says, no. And I said, you announced that that way. And if it were me, I'd be pissed. I'd be disheartened. I'd be discouraged. Because what this would say is, now we're going to get globalization, and this 40-year-old historic thing that we still haven't succeeded at will just become the usual again. So we can talk about that more if you'd like. So I want to talk today about capacity building. I hope I've set the tone here for you in terms of why the urgency and I want you to think technology. My view is that we've been thinking about diversity in the same way for about 40 years. And we have a moment now where we can build on all that we've learned to move it to the next level called institutional level. And here I want you to think technology. And part of the reason I say not if, but now, is we can talk about the projections about the country for years. But it's now. And so here's the technology. Years ago. And I'm old enough to know how long ago this was. When technology became a natural <coughs> imperative in our environment, we began with discussions about how are we going to educate students to live in a technological society. Do any, does anybody sort of remember mm -hmm. the visions of that? And we argued about whether word processing and computer literacy or whether we had to teach people Fortran. We had a very big debate about that. We had to define technology because some people thought it was uh, computer programming and some people thought it was using computers. I mean, it was a big debate. Very quickly, it became clear that technology was in our environment and that if our institutions were going to be viable, we were going to have to be technological and build the capacity as a technological institution. And it was going to hit every domain of our institution, quite apart from students. It was going to be how we function. So give me some quick examples. How, has, how do we watch the technological capacity of our institution? A campus that had no technology to go. I'm not coming. So what, it, what about technology attracts you to this place or it seems essential to the work you do, whatever work you do? Just shout out a few things. Wireless. Hmm? Wireless. Wireless. I mean, imagine if you came to a campus today. Now, this wasn't true five years ago, right? So technology is constantly changing. It's evolving. So it's not like we did it and done, and now it's checked off, and when is this going to be done? We know that technology is continually advancing, and we have to kind of build the ship as we go, right? Most of us don't know how to do any of it. So wireless. You would feel a campus that had no wireless today was really in the dark age. What else? Online courses. Online courses, distance learning, uh, the, the ability to connect with people in other places who don't on site. Again. Campuses, because of their mission, may say, we're going to do that in a big way, or that's not our mission, we won't do that. 
But increasingly, campuses are feeling they should do some of that. Yes? What else? Supported. Supported. How is it supported? Lots of staff. Lots of staff. Lots of technical staff helping <coughs> those that aren't as good at it. That's right. We understood that we had to build the capacity of faculty, of administrators, and even if they were sufficiently techno savvy, we understand there's an expertise that comes with technology that I, for example, don't want to have to learn. But we've got staff to do it. So we've built the human capacity. We've got budget. In fact, in the early years, before recently, people used to sit around budget committees and campuses and say, how much money do we need to spend on technology? No, and I think, I will have died and gone to heaven if someone said, how much money do we need to spend on diversity? But I'm not, <laughs> I'm not uh, naive. <coughs> but we put budget capacity. It's in virtually every strategic plan, either the, in the early days it was really there, and now it's in the next wave up there. We put it in the wall. There isn't a building that's built without thinking about what's the infrastructure capacity we need to do. And what about hiring? Has our hiring changed as a result of our understanding about te technological society in which we live? Anybody got some examples of people we might have hired as a result of technology? Video conferencing for interviews? Ah, for human resources, that's right. Considered to be a competency for, most, for many hiring positions. A competency in a job description for staff or administration. Imagine you were interviewing someone who says, I don't do email. <laughs> <laughs> we tolerated that for a while. <laughs> we didn't tolerate it for a while, but it's gone. So, competencies for hiring. Do you have a chief information officer here? We understood, see, but what happened in the early days was there was a plethora of technology stuff. The scientists had their own computers and technology, and some places were lagging, and so it became clear because everybody was buying their own stuff and doing their own stuff that we needed some strategic way to coordinate and make sure we were doing strategic allocations for technology. That's why we now have increasingly on campuses a chief diversity officer of some kind. Not supposed to do all the work, but rather to make sure we're strategic about it. Now, was it easy when we did the initial transition to a technological society? How easy was it to move from paper and pencil transcript or paper and pen transcripts to computerized transcripts? You know, our systems didn't work. Computers required check the box, and our transcripts were full of little asterisks and notes. So none of this was easy, was it? Deciding what computers and how to do that and the infrastructure, none of it was easy. But we move now to wireless as if, oh, we're moving to wireless. Uh, we move now to building it in the buildings. We just build it in the buildings. We no longer have to open up the walls and put it in because the buildings are building it. Are you getting my drift? So to me, there are two things that have been pervasive in our society as changes, a technological society and a pluralistic society. And what I want you to think about is take every once in a while, Substitute for diversity, technology, and ask, what did we do or what are we doing when we understand a technological society? And what do we or don't we do for diversity? Because that is what we're talking about when we talk about capacity. It has affected faculty hiring. In the STEM fields, all of a sudden, having industry partnerships mattered because we cared about the practice of industry. In days in the old age, you wouldn't have done that. So my view is that this is one of the two major things that's affected our environment, and we have to begin to say, how prepared are we as an institution to function in a pluralistic society? And that goes way beyond having undergraduate students who are diverse. It goes to our own capacity around the table to even make strategic decisions. In the early days of technology, everybody understood that we needed some tech people around the table. The senior people on campus had tech people around the table, because they didn't have a clue what we were talking about. And in the days when the dot-com industry was hot, we didn't care who was a high school student. We were going to identify technological competency and get them at our table. <coughs> Identifying talent, even if it didn't look like the usual folks. So that's my point about technology. And I want you to really think about that a lot, because I think it helps us move to this shift to the capacity of our institution. Because it is equally, if not more so, an imperative. Because unlike technology, diversity is an imperative for the health of our democracy. Technology is more imperative for the health of our uh, technological function. So we're going to move to the next level here.
you know, we need, and this is the next level of diversity work, to locate diversity as part of the institution and its mission. Why is this essential? We can make a rather refined argument for why technology was core, not marginal, not nice if you can get it, but core, and therefore not optional. Locate diversity, why is this core? If you can't answer that question, then it's always going to move to the margin. When there's a crisis, or budget crisis, or whatever happens, it's going to move. Diversity has to be part of core indicators of success. I'm going to give you some examples of that. It's not parallel. In many campuses, not so much on yours, we've got parallel discourses. We've got the diversity work, and then we've got the real stuff. So if you do accreditation, I, go to, I love to do, when I go to campuses, read strategic planning documents, accreditation documents. Not the ones that are for diversity, but just the regular ones. And then I ask, where's diversity in this plan? Where's diversity in accreditation? And if diversity isn't central to educational success, I don't know what is. But if you don't understand that, diversity will be a parallel process. And by the way, in this time of resource limitations and hiring freezes and budget freezes, the more the institution's capacity for diversity is built, the less one has to keep creating duplicate processes to compensate for institutional lack of capacity. We've got to move beyond project titus towards synergy and coordination. That is the technology example, the plethora of projects and programs. Programs are wonderful. They're important. They're vital. But just thinking that the way we're going to make progress on diversity is to add more programs is really to say, this is not core. This is quite marginal to what the institution's really about. We've got to monitor progress. How do you know you're making progress? You're all bright people here. And you've got to be able to say, we're making progress here, and we're not making progress there. A question. How many of you know the disaggregated graduation rates for Penn State? Okay, how many of you are student affairs folks? Academic administrators? So, you, my point being, if we don't know, we can't address the issue. And we've got to think about diversity as inclusive and differentiated. And since you've been using my framework, which I'm really so appreciative of, that came because I really thought if we as academics spend our time defining diversity, we're going to be out for 40 years, and I'm just going to just bear that thought. By the way, because I spent enough years trying to define technological competency, I knew not to go there. This framework really has four key dimensions, and many of you probably know it because that's your framework here. But what it allows is to make diversity inclusive and differentiated. So instead of the laundry list of diversity, race, class, gender, ability, gay, lesbian issues, um, age, what other issues have we got right here? You know the problem, the laundry list? What happens is it becomes a laundry list and then people feel like whatever they care about is lost. So this is my way of conceptualizing this. So we've got <coughs> access and success of historically underrepresented populations. This is the heart and soul. This is where it all began and should not just be lost as part of the um, a list. The second is climate and intergroup relations. And here we're asking, how does this place feel for the diverse populations that are here? This could be uh, related to gender. How does this place feel for a gay person? How does this place feel after 9-11 for a Muslim person? That's a much more inclusive category. We can attend to multiplicity. We don't have to pick one or the other. We can ask, how is this place for a Latino? How is this place for an African American? My guess in this part of the world is disaggregating even underrepresented becomes important because the experience here is very different. The education and scholarship dimension is really the core of the academic. What are we preparing people for? What is our research about? You're a land grant institution. What is your mission with respect to serving the people of Pennsylvania? And what are the issues for the people of Pennsylvania? I can't believe that health gaps, health inequities, educational inequities, urban issues, planning, um, urban toxicity for the environmental movement, uh, yeah. Stuff that land grants are supposed to schools of education. We train all the teachers in the state of Pennsylvania. How competent are they to do STEM work in third grade? That kind of stuff. And the fourth is really critical. It's the institutional viability and vitality. And here I hope my <coughs> reference to technology would get you to understand what that is. That is really about 
this is really about do you have the capacity, for example, in this domain, you might look at the diversity of faculty and leadership in the campus. Do you have the people sitting around the table who know what they're talking about? How does the community view you? Campuses like this are very sensitive to community regard. Well, which communities do you care about? Whose communities regard do you care about? And what is that regard? Are you viewed it? If, if I'm in Philadelphia, we were talking earlier today, if I'm in Philadelphia and a counselor working with kids and talking with them about where they might want to go to school, what's the reputation of Penn State for an underrepresented community, for gay students, or whatever? Has this place got a good reputation or a terrible one? If it's got a terrible one, why would you want to come here? So that issue about your institutional viability and vitality becomes critical. Now here I want to just give you some examples of centering this at institutional core things. These are recurring statements of institutional mission. And I was going to go on the website to get your particular ones, but I, said, I thought they probably resonate. Student success, including in the STEM field. That, is, is that a strategic issue for you, that students succeed? Okay. Preparing all students for participation and leadership in a diverse society. Is that something you would all probably nod your head about? No. Making a difference in the society and the community. Is that probably appropriate for a way grant? So now, effectiveness and diversity. Are students from different groups succeeding? Are students being prepared to function in a diverse society? And of course, given accreditation these days, and how would you know? Uh, how attractive is the institution to diverse groups? And here we're not just talking about students, we're just talking about how attractive are you? And what is the institution's capacity to educate successfully? Do you have what it takes? Just like if we're going to educate for a technological society, do we have the capacity? Now this is, and I showed this this morning, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but this is the six-year graduation rates for Penn State Disaggregated, <coughs> sorry. Ah. Going the wrong way. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's the red, it's the power button. Here. So this is disaggregated by race and ethnicity, African American, Latino, Asian, Native American, international, and white. And for Penn State is the blue, University Park is the purple, and green are the Commonwealth campus. So obviously Penn State is doing slightly better with respect to student success. Not surprising given your selectivity, I assume. Right? But the question really is, are these, is this profile adequate for you? Is this, are the gaps okay? You've got Native American students here, you've got white students here. You can see the profile there <coughs> about achievement gaps in terms of graduation success. Now historically what higher education has done is to say, well, we'll blame K-12, or we'll blame the community college. That day is over. You admitted students, and what we know is the success of students in the institution is not directly related to their preparation. That is, if you look at a retrospective study, look at who thrives and who doesn't, it's not necessarily connected to things like SAT students. It, it's a little counterintuitive, but it's clear. So you've got to ask this question about whether that's OK. But what's happening now naturally with accountability movements and also with most accreditation is, this probably isn't OK in terms of achievement gaps. Now, the other piece of the um, liability piece is diversity in leadership. And I want us to spend a second on this, particularly in faculty diversity. The common refrain for why we should diversify the faculty is because our students are getting more diverse. Right? That's usually the reason we get and while role models is very important, so I don't want to be heard as underestimating this, what I want to say is faculty hiring doesn't come around because we, we don't hire people because of who sits around the student table. That, that's not the right, that's not how faculty culture works. And that's not how leadership hiring works. We don't say, well, we have a lot more diverse students than we need somewhere. So I want us to take a minute here and just spend time to talk about the rationale because it's critically important that we have a much more nuanced understanding of the rationale for diversity. Sometimes when I give speeches, people say, well, you're preaching to the choir. So I'm assuming you're all the choir. You're committed to diversity here. Mm -hmm. But what I want to say to you is we've got to sing better. And we have to sing in three and four part harmony. Because when we just, in a matter of shorthand, because we all know what we mean, say, faculty diversity, yes, haven't made any progress, students are more diverse. We have just cut out 90% of the academic world. So here's some reasons. <coughs> ah, maybe I'll let you. Can you pop up with a few reasons? Why should we diversify, say, the faculty? Give me some reasons. Nobody 
meeting? It's for a richer community. What? It makes for a richer community. It makes for a richer community. There's an ample amount of research that shows that the more diverse your faculty is, the more diverse a lot of things happen in the curriculum, the content of the curriculum, community connections, I mean, all the things that our education is now struggling to do, do get richer. My thought has always been a session for a research institution where the idea is to push the boundaries of new knowledge and have a greater chance of doing that if you have a greater diversity of people who are working on that. Yes, and there's evidence to suggest that. In fact, what happens is it's not that there's uh, minority science. It's just that we know that people with multiplicities of identities tend to come at things in different kind of ways. And it's not one-to-one. -one. It doesn't mean that every African American is going to teach you know, new science in the same way. Not at all. But it does mean you're increasing the likelihood that people come at it from a completely different point of view. And there's plenty of evidence for that. And there's also policy issues. You know, it was really because women and minorities started pushing the National Institutes of Health to diversify the samples of people we did medical research on. <coughs> it had been okay for science to be doing medical research on white men. <coughs> did you know that breast cancer research was done on white men? Did you know that? Probably didn't know that. I didn't know that. But it's true. And the reason, earnest, well-meaning reason, was that women's hormones complicated the research design. <laughs> so we had to get rid of the hormones in order to do research on drug treatment for breast cancer. You see how silly that sounds? Right? Makes you scared about what was going on with those drugs when women took them. But, but as a result, the National Institutes of Health now require, they're not waiting for people just to do it, diversity in experiments, drug treatments, etc. I didn't know this, but did you know that women recover from knee replacement surgery slower than men? You did. Why did they? Do you know? Um, I saw it on the Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you know why? Um, I saw that they, they have more injuries on their knees because they, they tend to fall more knocky or it's the way they lay. Ah, that's one possible reason. The, the design of the knee was supposed to be The generic knee, generic now, nobody was saying this is a man's knee, I'm giving you a man's knee. Yes, Carol? <laughs> Did you get one of those knees? You got two of those good knees. It turned out, and this is the fear of the generic, it turned out that the generic knee was designed by men for men, but not named male, I mean, because otherwise a woman might rightly say, why are you giving me a man's knee? <laughs> but the, the word was, there is no gender in the knee. Well, it turns out there is gender in the knee. And only in the last year or two do we have a, a knee for women. Hip location, balance, you know, where the weight is in a woman is different than a man. So we now have a female knee. So when people start saying to you, well, don't start founding that feminist institutional racism, institutional sexism stuff, I'm not being political, actually. This is just good knowledge. We design generic things. The airbag <coughs> is another good engineering example, right? Airbags, what could have been a better thing to make cars put in their car? Airbags. Why did we put them in? Come on. Save lives. Save lives. <laughs> what, happened? what happened when we put them in? <laughs> Why did we kill them? Well, because the generic airbag was designed for the generic person, which was an average male, five foot ten, and I don't know what the weight was. That was the design of the airbag that went into every car you and I are driving. And they still haven't quite fixed it, so they now have, you know, like where they now can tell your weight when you sit down, so we don't have women and children killed. So, okay. I suspect if there had been more people sitting around that table, somebody would have said, uh, most people I know that are women aren't 5 foot 10 and 200 pounds. <laughs> so decision making gets better informed by having diversity. Perceptions of commitment and equity. The fact is that you can talk all you want about diversity and your commitment to diversity, but what people will do when they come to the campus say, what about your faculty? And I see the senior administrators here and I don't see much diversity. So our language and our perceptions of commitment go to what we see up there. Providing legitimacy. When we have an international initiative, we find every international faculty member who we can bring with us to that 
trip to Asia or China or South Africa? Yes? Because it gives us legitimacy. There's language, there's culture, there's just a perception that we have people in our world that can make the bridge connection to that world. So legitimacy. Knowledge for decisions, we've already talked about those. New approaches to scholarship. Relationships with diverse communities on and off campus. The fact is, we live in a highly segregated society. So as a well-meaning white person, I don't know much about the inner city schools of Philadelphia. Probably haven't gone to one ever. So our capacity to even reach out into community is a function of the diversity we have around our table. The community organizers who now know how communities work, about where people will listen and who's credible. Our attractiveness, I hope I made the point here, that our attractiveness is a function of our diversity. And our leadership development, the faculty piece of this is if we're not diversifying the faculty, we're not diversifying the next generation of department chairs and deans and provosts. And so there's a whole generation of folks who are retiring now, and what's happening with community colleges is there's a real shortage. What's happening is now more college presidents are serving seven pres second presidencies and now in their 60s when they used to be in their 50s. Why is that? Because we don't develop the capacity in our leadership development <coughs> program that will serve the purposes of our institutions. The issue of one-to-one, -one, and I want to say a word about this. We tend to think, and we talk this way a lot, students of color or people need someone who looks like them. In the classroom, I mean, if you ask students how many faculty you had who look like you, probably the answer is not much. But I think the thing that we're doing, we're oversimplifying there. For me, the issue is as much the absence of. What makes me a mentor for somebody, or you a mentor for somebody, may function as a result of many multiplicities of identities. Who knows where we'll connect? I mean, that is a human experience, right? So just because I'm a person of a particular background doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to be your best mentor. But the absence of, oh dear. I just did a study of the top 50 research universities, race and gender demographic profile of the faculty in the sciences and some social sciences. The number of zeros, occasional ones, across that demographic profile for anybody who wasn't white was horrifying. And then we wonder why people are attracted to go into science. It's not necessarily that everybody's looking to be mentored by the person who exactly looks like them, otherwise we're going to get very confused here. But, but the absence of it. If, if you're an African-American male and have never seen an African-American male physicist, why would you think physics is an inviting environment for you? Why would you even want to be the first in this day? So think about that a lot. It's the zeros and the occasional ones in many fields that signal a great deal about whether the institution is going to be attractive, have capacity, and be an environment in which people that are diverse want to be. And of course, role models is terribly important, and I won't, I don't want to underestimate what it means to have role models. And what that means is we need a lot more diversity in our leadership. Now, the research on faculty diversity <coughs> is pretty striking, and I spent a lot of time on this, so I'll summarize it for you very quickly. It's been very slow to change. So you see the usual, we've made progress on this, we've made progress on that, not so on faculty diversity. What we now know is the next generation of faculty is being hired. In the last 10 years or so, I would estimate that most campuses have changed, hired at least 50 to 60 percent of their faculty, which means we've only got about 10 more years to replace the faculty. And if they're not more diverse now, what's our chances of having the capacity we need for a society that's getting increasingly diverse? And, and I'll show you Penn State's numbers, the international faculty is growing fast. So that's where issues of perception come in. We're talking about diversity, we're doing all this international, and where we're hiring is international, because we know that our viability is contingent on having an international, a more global faculty, and I don't disagree with that. And our credibility is very much at stake if we don't think about domestic issues as well. We have found tremendous turnover issues. And I'll say a word about that. Graduate student diversity. I haven't paid much attention to graduate student diversity until we started tracking faculty diversity and graduate student diversity. Turns out the two most decentralized functions on our campuses are faculty hiring and graduate student admissions. And it turns out, even on campuses that have hugely diverse undergraduate populations, like Stanford, Graduate student diversity isn't a whole lot more diverse than the faculty diversity. And yours is that way too. So if we're thinking we're going to produce, if we want to use the pipeline argument, there isn't enough to hire, 
Well, then we have an obligation. We are preparing our own labor force. We have nobody else to blame but us if we're not diversifying the graduate students. And what we know about hiring on faculty is the mix and the reason. You know them? There aren't any. They wouldn't want to come here. We can't pay them. And when they come, they get leave. They leave to go to someplace better. The president of Harvard some years back told me that, and I nearly, you know, Harvard's using those myths, and we're in deep trouble. So there's a lot to say about that, but the fact is we're using a lot of myths and reasons. We have reasons why this isn't working. This morning I used as an example, in this budget times, if you were a VP for advancement, and you went to your president or chancellor and said, I can't, you know, it's a terrible climate for raising money. I just won't be able to do much this year. I, this is for the deans these days, too, right? Now, we all know it's a terrible climate. Nobody's, you know, no one's saying it's easy. Would that person be in the job the next year? No. We might tailor our goals a little, but we are not going to accept that reason. But with diversity, oh, we accept reasons. Lots of them. Most of them this. And then there's the story of one good year. That is, campus makes effort. They have a good year. And then you look four years later, and the same old stuff. Because diversity, and recruiting is hard, and we have a good year, we think we've done it, and now we're moving on. And then, of course, the process is really fundamentally about identifying talent and interrupting usual patterns. Everything we do in our usual patterns of faculty recruiting and general recruiting is going to produce the same stuff, from the diversity of the search committee to the mechanisms we use. And we can talk about that more if you wish. So here's University Park. These are the data. I apologize to the people from the other campuses. But the bottom line, this is the demographics of your faculty by race and ethnicity since 2003 to 2008. It's kind of data you should just display. So the bottom line here is underrepresented, historically underrepresented minorities here, no change in the last five years. 5% 5 in 2003, 5% in 2008. Non-resident, forgive the government's language, non-resident aliens, I'll keep that. 6% in 2003. 9%. That is where you see the change. We're, we get how to do international. We just don't get how to do domestic. And I think you need to pay real attention to this. The turnover issue turned out to be really important. And I won't spend a lot of time on this because I talked about it this morning. But the bottom line here was I noticed that the new hires, we had data from 28 campuses in California, and I noticed that the new hires were slightly more diverse, not a whole lot more, but slightly more diverse than the faculty as a whole. And such robust hiring was going on, these campuses were replacing 50% of their faculty, so it wasn't like they weren't hiring anybody. I thought, the overall demographic should have changed. Why didn't it change? And then I began, a, this is how my research now focuses on retention as well as hiring. In the past, it was just focusing on hiring. So I'll give you the quick example, and those who were there this morning can shout out the answers much faster than they did this morning. <laughs> <laughs> you have five Latinos in 2003, and you hire five. How many do you have? Ten. Thank you. <laughs> you have seven. How many did you lose? Three. Three. Three, and you hired five. That's 60%. That is the turnover quotient. It's fun to write it as a formula, but the fact is, what that means is three out of every five people you hired went to replace people who left. It's, a, it's an issue that is contingent on three numbers. That's all you have to know. Three numbers. And what it allows you to do is to see if you have a turnover issue. And in many of our campuses, we, I want you to see if I put that slide up. I couldn't remember where I left it in. On the campuses we work with, that I've worked, and I've been doing this on other campuses as well, about half of them have a turnover that was zero, meaning everybody they hired went to a place to add it to their diversity. The other half had an average turnover of 60%, which means three out of every five new hires went to replace people who left for underrepresented population. We sort of expect a high turnover for white men because they're returnable. But in fact, the, the retention rate for, high men, uh, for white men was not higher, sometimes lower, than it was for underrepresented men. These campuses have huge retention problems. One of the challenges is how do we know why? Because if you just ask people, there'll be no reason. Right? I'm going somewhere else. But we know because dual career issues, I cannot believe in State College, Pennsylvania, you don't have dual career issues. People don't move easily. So when people leave, you want to say, how do we know the real reason they're leaving? So turnover has become a big issue here. So that's the leadership diversity, the rationale, the lack of, and then using Penn State's number, 
And just very quickly while I finish, some lessons from research in other domains. When done well, diversity has educational benefits. It in, it, with diversity done well, increases satisfaction, retention for lots of people. The perceptions of institutional commitment to diversity are critical. And that's not just students, it's faculty and staff. You go around and say, do you believe your institution is committed to diversity? If the answer isn't yes, what you've got is a huge gap between rhetoric and felt experience. And if there's a big gap between rhetoric and felt experience, that's even worse than a campus that doesn't stay, that says it's not committed to diversity. Because at least you know what the score is. It is directly tied to excellence and accountability. And my student success numbers disaggregated show you that. We are in a time now where institutions are being asked to be accountable for graduation rates. Now, we can take the easy way and say, well, we'll just pass everybody, pass it to the faculty. But that's not serving our society and the nation in the future. What we're saying is high expectation, but we, have, we cannot allow the, gap, the gaps to occur. Interestingly enough, there's many conversations on our campus about self-segregation. Do we have those conversations here about students who are all clustering together? Well, what we know now is that identity groups, particularly in majority white institutions, are critically important to student success and are a place where you can use capacity to help with the intergroup dialogues that are going to become increasingly important. So it's not an either or, it's an and issue here. But it means a sophisticated understanding about identity. Because the fact is that the research is pretty clear that the people who are self-segregated on most campuses like this are white. You look at your data, in fact, I looked at your Nancy data, it was your white students said they had less contact with students of color. The students of color are doing fine, because you can't live in this campus and not interact with white students. <laughs> but, but we weren't talking about self-segregation with white fraternities for decades. We, that was just fine. So one of the problems is we cannot then continue to frame that the problem is always with the communities of color or the gay and lesbian communities. That's the problem. The problem is our institution's capacity and dominant communities, their function. So what we've come to to know here is for effectiveness, if I were to synthesize something, mission mattering and multiplicity, create healthy communities, the three X's. Mission, embedded in your mission. People need to feel like matter. The reason so many student uh, groups, identity groupings on campus are so important, that they will always be important, but that they're so important is that students do not feel they matter in other places. Imagine that we have students who have multiplicities of identities, they do. They're sociologists, they're football players, they're Latinos, they're male, they're from Pennsylvania, they're from a weird place called California, whatever the identities are. They're in the choir, uh, they like drama. The key issue here is that on too many campuses, students who are token in their situations, they're the only one in a classroom, for example, can't feel that they matter in any way that, because it sounds like the institution must not value Ooh, that part of me because there aren't any others like me. So to the degree that we can ask in every function on campus, do, do we have the capacity to have students of all backgrounds, to have faculty of all backgrounds, and staff of all backgrounds feel that they matter? Then we are going to have better and healthier communities. To the degree that people don't feel that they matter, they're going to go to the communities in which they do feel they matter, which tend to be the more salient identity groups on our campuses. So think about that a lot. And clearly, diversity and leadership is critical for all the things we said. So this is not about affirmative action, it's about mission and excellence. You notice I didn't have to mention 209, Michigan. I just finished a book synthesizing all this stuff and I had to remind myself to put the legal issues in there. They're there, campus have to, but it's driven too much of our diversity work. This is about excellence and capacity and a society. Good education matters. It turns out when we have good education, background characteristics fade away as a particular success. When we do usual education or bad education, then background characteristics are the best predictor of success. So you decide whether you want to be an institution that interrupts or follows the pattern of letting whatever background characteristics students bring dominate and determine how they will do here. This is about today building capacity for difficult dialogue and relationships. Our campuses are parallels. And this isn't about students, just students. This is about staff, and faculty, and administration, I said this morning. University of California, Irvine, is paralyzed every time somebody comes to speak about the business paralyzed because they haven't figured out a way to build their capacity to have a conversation between Palestinian and Jewish students about the Middle East. So just paralyzed. So this is going to come become more of an issue, not less of an issue, as our society gets more diverse. We need to take advantage of disequilibrium. The nice thing about having an incident is that it creates an opportunity for change. But the question is, do you have the capacity to take advantage of that to move forward? 
The other thing that I've learned from thinking about technology, actually, is we've got to change the culture congruent with the culture, and that may seem paradoxical. But the fact is, what we learned about technology is that the world didn't end. In the days of technology, the people who hated it were resistant to it. Books were going to die, and libraries were going to close up, and, and even leadership talked about it. Maybe we don't need libraries anymore. It's all virtual. We'll just put them in the, in the basement. And, right? That was the conversation about libraries. Well, what's happening? I don't know about your campus, but every campus I've been on is spending millions of dollars to invest in the library. It's the campus hub. There are cafes. There are coffee shops. There. Oh, this is a hub. So what happens in a time where we can't project forward, because we, very few of us have lived in a pluralistic society that works, one of the things that happens is we project that we're frightened about it. The worst that can happen. And so the issue here is, what's central to our culture? And that requires a first conversation. What does excellence mean in the sciences? And what are the things that can stay the same because it really is core to science? And what is it going to have to change because it's part of the culture of science that's dysfunctional? So it's, how do we keep the culture, the things that matter, excellence, educational effectiveness, research that makes a contribution to the world? Those things I don't think should change. But there's a lot of stuff around it that can and will change. And distributed leadership. The reality is that if a president is the only one talking about this, it's going to fail. Because department hiring, faculty hiring, graduate student admissions, what student affairs does, what the English department does, what the chemistry department does, rests at the department level. So you need leadership at every level to make this go forward. So for all of us who are trying to work on this, framework and monitoring progress. You've got a framework, you're beginning the process of monitoring progress with intelligent metrics, as I call them. Centrality to mission. If you're a research university, then why is your diversity effort central to that? If it's just about undergraduate admissions, you've marginalized it right from the get-go. It's going to require leadership and communication, intentionality, and an inclusive and differentiated approach. We can deal with the multiplicities of identities that an institution needs to attend to, even as we maintain and make progress on these historic issues that we have failed to. For faculty, staff, and deans, student success and learning, hiring, program review. <coughs> Who comes in to do program reviews and how diverse are those people? Because if it's not diverse, you're going to get the can. And that, that becomes a problem. And I'll give you an example. There was a campus in Ohio. The community, the community of color, the African-American community was really upset about the fact that this campus touted its rhetoric for diversity, but they didn't see much diversity in hiring. There was a part-time person in the dance program. I hope I don't reveal any confidence. It's long enough ago. Who was an Alvin Ailey trained <coughs> So if you know Alvin Ellie's company, these are ballet-trained African-American companies. Extraordinary. Well, she had been hired as a part-time basis on soft money, was revitalizing the whole dance program. I mean, everybody, the students were just thrilled, not just students of color, the students were thrilled. And she had the ballet and the modern dance, and I mean, it was just fantastic. And people were, she was on soft money, so people wanted to keep her. And lo and behold, wouldn't you know, there was an opening in dance. Well, that's a slam dunk. Everybody loves her. An opening. This is... Well, what happens? Turns out the department chair had had some political warfare with colleagues. And the curriculum committee of the campus decided it was time before they replaced that position to do a program review. And they brought in an outside team, which is what we do. Not a diverse team. What did the, what did the team say? You can't have it. This is an undergraduate liberal arts place, by the way. It's not a conservative. You can't have a dance program or anything if you don't have a ballet person. So guess what happened? She's gone, and people are just frustrated and angry. And what was clear was that nobody understood they had a canon debate going on here. They just were regretful. And interestingly enough, this happened 15 years ago. I was just on that campus last month. That still burns. So program review. And fundamentally, this is about attractiveness. Now, the reality is that you can see that this is increasing. I woke up in the middle of the night one night and said, no child left behind coming to a campus near you. And we know that no child left behind, we know that no child left behind is an imperfect and problematic policy approach to K-12, right? But why did it happen? It happened because K-12 spent the rest of its, its entire life giving reasons, the family, the community, for the lack of graduation and success of students in K-12. Lots of reasons to allow people to fail. And finally, the government, who has now very limited tools to make people do anything, put no child. Well, guess what's happening in our conversations in higher education? Accountability, achievement gaps, 
and the metric, the intelligent metric being used, the perfect metric being used, graduation rate. So you look at yours and say, can we demonstrate that we are successful in eradicating achievement gaps, or are we just going to look like everybody else? So no child left behind. Tied to the accountability movement. Reasons and excuses, our future is a society rests on the future, not only of the educational level of our citizens, which is going down now. The Luminates made this as a goal, to raise the educational level of the country, going down because of these dropout rates. Um, and the STEM field and our capacity of science, we can't do this anymore. We go right to the health of a pluralistic society. Just an analysis of how Social Security is probably going to get people worried about the educational levels in our society. Our credibility in the world. We saw it with the recent election. <coughs> our credibility as a democratic, pluralistic society that works rests on our being a pluralistic society that works. <laughs> we're losing that gap. I mean, you know, we used to be, we were the place that had mass higher education. The rest of the world is moving to mass higher education. And it's not going to be okay to have educational gaps continue and sustain if we care about how we see ourselves in the world. There's impatience and frustration and fatigue on our campuses. If we care about the people who are doing this work as our rhetoric increases, we better make sure that we really mean it this time and are not simply going to put three people through just yet another version of a task force, an imperative, <coughs> and a study that could have been written 40 years ago. We're not going to take this information and make change. And of course, our budget resource challenges mean that we have to be very strategic about how we use our resources. And the more central they are to our core mission, the more important it's going to be. So understand, your choir, understanding why diversity is core to the mission of this place is critical to the future of our society. And with that, I will stop and take whatever questions. Thank you. Um, just before we begin, um, we are recording this event, so we would like you to ask your question in a microphone, and I'll go over, I have a microphone, so if you have a question, I'll I'll get it to you, and we have a couple microphones here, so um, as you ask your, your question, uh, please use the mic. Somebody be brave. <laughs> there was a question floating around this morning, shall I pose it to you? You're doing an international initiative. Yeah? What do I think about international things, given what I'm talking about? Is that a fair enough question? Sure. How might you think about that institution? You know, 40 years ago, I, there was the same discussion, domestic diversity and international diversity. And I decided 40 years ago I was drawing a line in the sand. And my line was going to be, I'm caring about domestic diversity. Let somebody else worry about the world. Well, as with everything else evolving, and partly because of immigration, our boundaries are no longer so clearly and cleanly drawn. These boundaries are very porous. And if you live in California, do I make a distinction between the student who just came, whose family came from Mexico and is a first generation? I mean, you know, those boundaries aren't clean anymore. But what I will say is, when I look at campuses that have international initiatives, and I look at the faculty hiring, and I look at us touting globalization and taking study groups off to China or Thailand or wherever you all went but, uh, um, and building campuses with Saudi Arabia. All good. You saw in my changing domain of diversity that I really do see this work in an international context. I see the issues of equity, equity and justice and health and well-being of democracies and societies and communities as an international phenomenon. But the reality is on most of our campuses, we're much more comfortable going to China than we are to whatever the name of your local urban community is. Philadelphia? What is it? Pittsburgh? What, what's, what's an urban community that most people... <laughs> yeah, yeah, around here it may not be. But the point being, the point being that we, are, we, we find ourselves more comfortable with that more exotic phenomenon than our local. Do I want you to have to choose? I'd rather you find a way to intersect those two. But the reality, my fear, and I'm back to drawing my little line in the sand, is both with the STEM fields and with the faculty hiring, is we get how to hire. And what really, forgive me, upsets me, is, makes me mad, is I began to learn how much money we spend arranging visas for those international faculty we wanted to hire. In other words, this is not simple. It took money. 
tens of thousands of dollars for immigrant lawyers to get visas for these wonderful faculty we wanted to hire. And yet, domestic diversity hiring is just hard. So, that's my... Any other questions? I have a question for here. So, when you talk about the capacity building, I, I believe everything you're saying, you mentioned that. I guess my question is, from your research and what you've done with your own experience, how do you start to build that capacity uh, with individuals who may think that this is the perfect place, this is this is where we are, this is where we should be. So how do we take, how do we start to build that capacity with individuals who who are stuck, um, so to speak? Let me say two things about that. One is you're not going to get everybody. Just like technology, play, well, how do we build a capacity with technology? Let me tell you that not everybody was just you know they were the ones who loved to play with the teching equipment. But there were a lot of naysayers. And what finally got people was the levers of a society that was changing. And the ones that didn't want to play were allowed, were tolerated. You know, you didn't have to be on email for a while. So I'm good, we're not going to convince everybody. The issue, and this is where leadership comes in, this is the strategic plan of this place. Where is diversity in, in your viability as an institution, a land-grant institution serving Pennsylvania However you want to frame it, what is that lever? What was the lever for globalization? Well, we've seen that the world is a much more interconnected place, and that has implications for our curriculum, our research, our faculty hiring. So for me, the question is, what is the imperative of diversity? Now, in California, it's a no-brainer. <coughs> in, in, in a state in which there is no majority population. And you look at the educational levels in California, and you should be very frightened when you disaggregate it by race and ethnicity. So the imperative is partly economic, but it's not just economic. It's the development of a healthy, pluralistic society that works. Which means we know we're in a pluralistic society. Not, I was doing some work for Maine, and I said, why are you worrying about diversity in Maine? It's one of the least diverse states in the country. Right? So the lever is not demographic. In California, it's demographic in part. They said, because people don't stay in Maine. They go to New York. They go to Chicago. So I would ask you, where are your students going? Any lever that you can think of, and this is what I mean about singing or in three-part harmony. What are the levers? You know your place. What are the levers you can use to say this is essential as a national and a state imperative? Health care inadequacies, I, you, know, you know you have educational gaps. And here's one that I'll give you. Sometimes we talk about higher education as the, the, the elite end of a pipeline, right? I think of higher education as the beginning of that pipeline. And for every kid that has a teacher who can't, and I'll use STEM again, for every kid that is a third grade teacher who has no capacity to help them ex be excited about science, I want to look to a school of education and the scientists around to say, what are we doing to build the capacity of the teachers, the principals, the superintendents, you train a lot of those here, to get K-12 functioning the way they should. And nobody questions that the system we have now is scary for the future of the society. So that's how I would think about that, and I would not worry about the naysayers. I'd more worry about key leadership and what pressure is there to change. What happened with technology was people saw the handwriting on the wall. We had a, we had opportunistic funds. We got people, I mean, the most effective thing for faculty is located at center to the educational mission. Don't just use it as a demographic issue. And then say, we've got professional development funds to send you to wonderful meetings to talk intellectually about your field. We know what it's going to take to produce effective science graduates in your kind of place now, and don't worry about K-12. We know what it's going to take. The question is, do the faculty have the capacity? You can send them to such places so they can learn. You've got the diversity expertise right here on your campus. So that's how I would think about it, and I would not worry about the naysayers. The world has changed. And the question is, do you all understand the need for Penn State to change in a way that puts this at the center? So look at every document you write that has not to do with diversity and see if diversity is there. If not, we've got some work. I hope I answered. Well, you, you answered, but I think, I, I think the problem comes, with, with, I guess, with the leadership. Uh, That's exactly. I, I think that when there are people who want this to grow, but you're, you're at a certain rank, you're at a certain position that you, you really don't have the say um, in those other circles to get things done. So, and then you have to find, like, for example, my, I'm an administrator here as well as a student, and the only person of color on central staff who wants to get things done. And, as you mentioned before, the person who's, who's in charge of uh, 
looking at diversity for the department, um, but how do you have these conversations when everyone else thinks it's, it's all okay? That's right. Um, so it's that you can, you can try and build capacity, but if you're building capacity with people who already know it all, so, you know, then... So key leadership becomes critical. You know, because what I learned, I talked to somebody recently on a campus in Colorado, and when she gave me the profile of where was the impetus for change, I said, maybe you don't want to push against the, the rock. I was just meeting with the regents of the University of California, and they were concerned about diversity. And I thought, this is the same regents that had 209 and Lori Connolly, and I thought, what universe am I in? Why are you worrying about this? Because the state of Cal University of California, research and elite as it is, serves the people of California. And if the University of California continues to look like the University of California looks, then maybe we won't love it anymore. In other words, really putting that pressure on to say, what does is, what is leadership look like? And the region started to get too micromanaging on faculty hiring. And I said, no, your job is to ask for the accountability metrics. There are some very intelligent metrics you can use to manage your progress. And your job is, as people on the campus are struggling to push this damn rock up this hill, which they've been doing for 40 years, your job in leadership is to reach down and help pull it up. So the key becomes, do you have those core leadership folks in place who may not get it all the time, but need to surround themselves with people that they can trust and talk to so that they don't make too many mistakes, and keep this moving forward? You've got some elements in place here. But what you may not have is the synergy. So you're left to feel alone in your place, pushing rocks up hills, right? The question is, there are a lot of other people here trying to pull the rock up. Is there connections among them? So you're not by yourself doing that. And increasingly, where's the provost and the deans in saying to the other leadership groups, this won't do, we can't look like this. One of the things that's been very interesting to me is in the NSF has been very helpful in the sciences because they basically say you're not getting any money if you don't worry about, worry about K-12 education and you don't diversify. I mean that, that's what NSF has done. But what's so interesting is with the advanced program, which is about women in science, they talk about transformation. They're not blaming the women for their issues in science. They all know that it's about institutional change. <coughs> when it comes to diversity with race and ethnicity, particularly historically underrepresented groups, it's so interesting how we spend our time talking about the pipeline. So the issue now is to kind of make that shift. That's what I'm trying to help us do, to say, where is this institutionally and what has to change? And then to use whatever examples we can to help do that. And you have to decide as an individual whether you're working in a context in which there's real leadership willingness to partner, or whether it's a lost cause and you work there helping. Because what we've done with most of the programs, for people who do diversity work, is they're there to protect the students to help them succeed in spite of the institution. <laughs> yeah? They're band-aids. And that will be needed for a long time. So you may say, that's my work. And it satisfies me because at least I see these students getting through this mess. But at some critical moment, the institution has to say, that's not enough. We have to change the institution for the benefit of everybody. So that's how I would, and it can happen. And that's why these frameworks and indicators, that's why I would read every one of your four documents and see where diversity is in it. Um, I was on a campus where the president was eloquent about diversity, just eloquent. I mean, it just made my heart sing. And then I had an opportunity, because I was visiting, to, I asked for the strategic plan, which was going to the board of trustees the following week to be approved. And there was virtually nothing in it about diversity. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I thought, gee, if I were on this campus, I'd be really upset. Because I had just been, my heart singing, and then it's crashing. That, that would have been the experience. So I went to the president, and I said, uh, just that. I, I heard what you said, and it was eloquent, and if I were on this campus, I'd be pissed. Well, he didn't know me, and he said, who's this woman, and what is she, how dare she speak to me about this? <laughs> Catholic institution, culturally nice. Um, <laughs> then he went out and asked to read this, this was his strategic plan, he'd been drafting. He wrote it, he read it through those lenses. And then he came back, uh, I was on the campus for several days, and he said, I have a confession to make. And I said, what? He said, the day after you came to my office and said that, the African American faculty members at my institution were meeting me to were meeting with me to express their outrage at the absence of diversity in this strategic plan. So those can be teachable moments for our leadership, just as the student activism can be teachable moments for our leadership. You have a harder time in Pennsylvania and Ohio than we do in California, where it's right on your back. Thank you all. Appreciate your attendance. <laughs>
Uh, I, didn't, I didn't rap it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't. I, I had nothing to do with rapping on the